joining us this evening. My name is Amy Adams, and I am the events coordinator for the Medina County District Library. I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. Thank you to everyone who has submitted questions in advance to the web form that was listed on the Medina County District Library's website. We are going to do our best to answer as many questions as possible this evening, um, but we may not be able to get to all of them in our one hour together. You are welcome to leave your video feeds on, but all microphones will remain muted for the duration of the program. For best viewing, please select speaker view, which is located in the upper right hand corner of your screen. If you have not already, please let me know in the chat box how many people are viewing from your location. Please also be aware that this program will be recorded and will be posted on the Medina County District Library's YouTube channel for viewing after this pro program concludes. Can you believe that it was almost one year ago yesterday that a state of emergency was declared by Governor DeWine in the state of Ohio due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Now almost three months have passed since the first COVID-19 vaccine was administered outside of clinical trials. As vaccines become more available, healthcare providers like the Cleveland Clinic and the Medina County Health Department want to ensure that you have the correct information and know where to turn for the most up-to-date information. Our panelists this evening are Dr. Richard Shoebridge and Ms. Krista Wasowski. Dr. Shoebridge currently serves as the president of the Medina Hospital where he has worked for over 13 years. He is an American Board of Internal Medicine certified in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. He is an assistant professor of clinical internal medicine with Neomed, and he and his wife Sally live in Medina and have three children together. Ms. Wasowski serves as the Medina Ho County Health Commissioner and has served Medina County since July of 2012. Previously, she was the Health Commissioner for Morrow County in Ohio. She holds master's degrees in social work and public health from The Ohio State University. She resides in Montville Township with her husband, Richard. They have two sons who are both graduating this coming May. Welcome to you both, and thank you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedules to be here with us this evening. Dr. Shoebridge, let's go ahead and start with you, and let's talk about your experience this past year at the Medina Hospital. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like at the Medina Hospital working during a global pandemic? Well, at first it was very scary. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Okay, good. So yeah, it was very scary. So we had to learn how to take great care of patients right from the get-go and, and start uh, trying some therapies uh, that would have been um, coming from the research. So we had to not only take good care of patients, but we had to protect each other from the virus. So we had to learn how to use the protective equipment and start building that culture of hand washing, social distancing, masking, wearing face protection in the hospital. Those types of things were coming along <clears throat> as we went. So we had also had to put into place some contingency plans. We didn't know how many patients we were gonna get uh, and how, uh, you know, how, what the severity of illness was going to be. So we made a whole bunch of surge plans in case we had to uh, take care of a lot larger patient number of patients than we expected. Fortunately, our largest number of patients we didn't have here until December of uh, 2020 and uh, just this past January. And since then, their case numbers have gone down dramatically, which is very good to see. But we're still at a plateau that is... Uh, puts us at risk uh, to maybe have another surge if we're not careful. So that's why we're, we're gonna continue the masking, social distancing and hand washing for quite some time. And we can talk a little bit about that. What does that mean around the vaccine as we get into our discussion tonight? But that's what we've been going through here. And we certainly appreciate the, the uh, care and commitment and um, donations that we've received from the community to help us get through this. It's been very gratifying. Thank you. And Ms. Wazowski, could you share a little bit about what the health department's role has been in tackling the global pandemic from a county level? Sure, sure. You know, Amy, you said, can you believe it's been a year? And I don't, I don't think I can, I can believe it's been a year because we have been in what we consider incident command, meaning like all hands on deck mode for, for a solid year now. So, you know, in, in the very beginning, that a, a very quiet part of our agency is the communicable disease team. Um, most folks don't come into contact with them very often, um, but 
we follow up by law on over 60 reportable diseases and we follow up um, to make sure that they're contained and don't spread and people know how to do that. So that really became front and center um, when we, after we saw our first case March 16th in the county. So certainly that contact tracing component, but maybe some of the things that um, some of the people on the call might not know tonight is that we worked very closely with all of our nursing homes um, to put up, to work with them on measures that they could do to increase safety. Um, Cleveland Clinic was a big part of that uh, as a resource um, for a lot of education and bringing in a lot of testing and things like that for folks. And then certainly doing a lot of education during the early parts, which we sort of forget about now that we're in this, this exciting vaccine phase, you know, that we had the closures and the stay at home orders and the enforcement of that, and then the reopening and, and helping businesses and helping employers know what was safe and what we could do and reassuring people to kind of start our economy back up a little bit while still containing disease. So all of those things have been happening. And then um, that last, those couple of days right before Christmas when we got the first doses of vaccine for the county and, and got our EMS taken care of and it's just been full force with vaccine ever since then. And do you mind explaining a little bit about the state's phasing system about vaccine distribution and like the leveled system? Yeah, our state took the approach that they wanted to kind of do vaccine in phases because it was such a limited resource. They had to make some decisions as a state what was gonna be our strategy. So we went into the federal program that matched a couple national pharmacies with our nursing homes to get them protected, and then went with an, um, a system of our healthcare workers, which um, Dr. Shubridge and all the the frontline the front the frontline hospital staff and um, uh, workers were taken care of, and then we we looked beyond that. Um, the state started that approach, and then of course we went into the ages, 80 plus and below, and then some certain medical conditions that we knew could lead to um, a more difficult um, a more difficult time with the, with the vaccine and perhaps a worse outcome. So that's what we've done as a state. Other states have chosen a different route for different reasons. I think what we have to look at is that Ohio, we have 11 million people and we're different than maybe other states. They have different numbers of employees that work in different sectors. So some states like Michigan went with some sectors and ages. We went with a very small number of sectors and mostly ages and medical conditions. So it's just how Ohio did it. And we did get one question that wanted to understand if Medina County was behind other counties in vaccine distribution. And I, I had gone on the Ohio Department of Health's website um, just a couple days ago and it looked like Medina's at about 17% of the population has been at least gotten their first dose of the vaccine for um, eligibility. Now, it, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that seemed comparable to the other counties. Yeah, the we as a state, as of today's dashboard, we're at 17.85% as a state. Medina County is at 17.59%. So we're, we're right in there with, with the state average. That's excellent. Thank you for explaining that. Sure. So now it's, it's a free for all, whoever would like to respond. Um, but we got a few questions about the different vaccines. So we know that there are three vaccines, the Moderna, the Pfizer, and the Johnson & Johnson or the Jensen vaccine. And which of those are currently being distributed in Medina County? We, we have both, we have all three in Medina County right now, mostly Pfizer, most of our providers have Pfizer. We have a couple, I know um, Giant Eagle and Marks have Moderna right now and they've had that for a while. There's a little bit of Johnson & Johnson, not a lot right now, but that vaccine is was really in production, right Dr. Shoebridge? So we'll be seeing more of that probably in about three or four weeks, we'll be seeing more of that product more readily available in the state. And can you explain what the difference is between the three vaccines? Right. So the first uh, two that came out, the, the Moderna and the Pfizer project, are uh, mRNA vaccines. And mRNA is a 
uh, nucleotide sequence that comes out of the nucleus of the cell and it's the blueprint for making proteins and other structures in, in the cell. So it's not the DNA, not the genetic material, but it is produced from that. But when it's, in, when it's injected into our muscle cells, it tells that cell to make the spike proteins that we've seen from the pictures of the uh, virus. And then the spike proteins get put on the surface of the cell and the immune system can see, can see it when this, the white blood cells uh, come by and the antibodies are, are working. And that allows the immune system to develop a reaction. Uh, and remember, uh, in case we do get exposed to the real COVID virus, if that were to happen. So both of those are extremely effective, uh, near 100% at preventing severe disease, as is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine works in a single dose, whereas the first two have to be dosed uh, two times because the first dose of the mRNA vaccine produces an immune reaction that's a little on the, on the smaller side, but then it's much bigger with the second dose. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine can give a bigger uh, immune reaction with just one dose because it has a different vector. It is, the mRNA is in the cell, is in a virus, a weakened virus, a very common virus that is of no, no uh, harm or disease causing uh, in, the, in the vaccine, but our, because our immune systems have seen it before, it is able to generate a much bigger response from just one dose. And then those proteins are put on, on the top of the cells and then uh, the same, type of memory reaction occurs. So there's a subtle difference between the two, but um, one uh, certainly is, is gonna be convenient for some populations in that they only have to dose once, but uh, all three of them are extremely good at preventing severe disease, which is exactly what you want from a vaccine. And what an amazing scientific accomplishment to have three different vaccines available here in the, at, at just the one year point that have been not only tested and found to be working, but have been extremely well tested to be finding that they're safe and that they're not causing disease or problems related to the vaccine itself, um, other than extremely rare cases. So we're, we're very fortunate that that's happening and that's gonna allow us to get to that level of immunization that's gonna bring the immunity that will allow us to chase the virus away. So, in a, one of the questions was they indicate the <clears throat> participant indicated that a recent study suggests that the mRNA vaccine induces a weaker immune response in the elderly compared to middle-aged and younger adults. Will a test for immune response after vaccination be readily available to anyone who wants to receive it? So. Can you kind of debunk what that means um, yeah. by the weakened uh, immune response from the mRNA vaccine? Well, let me work it backwards in that folks who are older um, typically do have a, a weaker immune response to vaccinations. Um, so it's not surprising to find that uh, older populations may have a little bit less in the reactivity. However, in the studies, even in the older age groups, the protection against severe disease was very, very good. So that's, that's great. The, the um, thing about the, the reaction being weaker with the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, we know that it does give a little bit weaker response uh, with a single dose, but when you give it the second time and the immune system sees it a second time, that allows a bigger uh, reaction, allows the immune system to kick in in a bigger way that, that brings that immunity up. Um, or that protection up that we're looking for from the vaccine. So now we, we did receive a question about the ingredients and the patents on the vaccine. And one of the things that I will do um, after the session concludes is once the recording is uploaded to our YouTube channel, I do have the links to the FDA's ingredient lists um, that I will send out to all participants this evening for each of the three vaccines that link directly to the FDA's ingredient list. Um, I also have the link to the U.S. Patent Office where all patents are actually held through the patent office. However, please be aware that most patents do take time to file. Um, and I believe that it's usually about a, an 18 month turnaround for them to be publicly available. So you may need to contact the US Patent Office directly should you need that sooner. 
No. Um, sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's fine. Uh, our next question is about the ingredients of the vaccine. However, it might not be listed so specifically on the FDA's website. Um, there was a question about if the vaccines include, it's two parts, do they include any human tissue? And then the second part of the question is, are there any bacteria, fungi, or plant cells in the vaccines? Uh, I think there's, I, I don't believe there's any human tissue in there. There is the mRNA, which is actually the strand of material from the, um, replicated from the virus itself, uh, but it's not, doesn't contain any of the, the, the actual full genetic component of the virus, only that, that part that's going to generate the construction of that spike protein that causes the immune system to react. So it doesn't have any uh, of those other ingredients or other living uh, tissue in it. Now the Pfizer, uh, uh, the, um, the J&J vaccine does have that, that viral vector that I spoke about, that weakened, uh, very common virus that we all um, are, are seen and reacted to in the past. So uh, technically that is part of that vaccine, but it is not any disease causing virus uh, of any kind. And then we do have a few specific questions. Um, we had a number of um, questions submitted that were inquiries about if there was one vaccine that was better for individuals with autoimmune diseases. Um, so one, the first part of the question is, is there one vaccine that's better than another for individuals with autoimmune diseases? And the second part of that question is, is it safe for individuals with autoimmune diseases to receive the vaccine? So, so yes, it is safe for folks with autoimmune disease to receive the vaccine. Uh, in many cases, when you think of autoimmune diseases, you would think that that's a weakness in the immune system. But in many cases, the autoimmune disease is actually a, a sign that the, that the immune system is overreacting to your own body tissue and it's being I, I describe it to patients as being like a big bully to your own body and causing problems um, uh, with uh, things like lupus or arthritis that causes destruction in the joints or cause, can cause type 1 diabetes if uh, antibodies are against the pancreas. So um, oftentimes uh, people with autoimmune diseases may need to go on steroids, which suppresses the immune system. And that's where the problems with infections come in. But there's uh, no indication that we should be avoiding uh, vaccination of people with autoimmune, autoimmune diseases. Have you seen similar guidance from the state, Krista? I have. <laughs> that is what the CDC and the state are saying in their guidance. And then the second question is again, very specific, but I, I, I'd like to ask it um, is, this individual says, in the past I had a prolonged Epstein-Barr viral infection and also cancer surgery that removed 15 pelvic lymph nodes. I am concerned that the COVID vaccines will reactivate the viral infection or cause illness due to the removal of those lymph nodes. Am I immunocompromised due to either of these conditions? Is it safe for me to receive the vaccine? I don't know the entire specifics of your case, but that sounds like a pretty good description that, that would indicate that, again, it would probably be best in your best interest to get the vaccine to be protected against severe COVID disease, which could be devastating in, in your situation. Uh, so I would, I would recommend that the vaccine, uh, you get the vaccine, and I think there's very little to no risk that would reactivate any uh, viral activity based on your prior viral infection. Okay, so let's move on to getting the vaccine. Um, so Ms. Wasowski, would you like to talk about how does someone sign up for the vaccine? Yes, well, the state, the state has uh, begun a, a single location to get information. So uh, the idea, I believe in coming weeks, is to try to have that be a place where everyone, that one spot where you can go and register and actually find an appointment. Um, that's still being, uh, the, they're working out the mechanics of that. 
So in some parts of the state, if you go to gettheshot.coronavirus.ohio.gov, you can see throughout the whole state all the providers who have vaccine. And there's a link there that'll take you right to their registration process. And the idea being in, in future weeks that you'd be able to click a link and see who has vaccine available and be able to schedule through them. But as you can imagine, you know, we had to get started before any of that was built. And each of us have our own process right now. I know at Cleveland Clinic is very simple. If you don't have a my chart, right, Dr. Schubert, to get a my chart, it takes you a that's few right. minutes. And that's their process. And then here at the health department, you can go to armorvax.com or you can give us a call here at the health department and get on our list to be a, a pay, we call a paper registration with us. That's our process. I know at Drug Mart, you can walk into your neighborhood Drug Mart and tell them that you wanna get on their list or you can go to their website and register. And then our other pharmacy partners right now all have at their websites going on and registering. But if you go to the one spot, the Get the Shot website, you can see there's a link to all everybody's and you can do it all from one spot. I know that sounds complicated and, and I wish it wasn't so complicated, but um, we do want to get vaccine to places where people are mo most comfortable to receive vaccine and we want to make it as convenient as they can. Some people, because of medical conditions, really want to get it through their provider, through their hospital system that they've been a part of. And some people want to go to their pharmacy and some people want to come to their health department. And the state decided to decentralize and get vaccine out as widely as possible because we didn't want to miss anyone. Um, but in doing that, it's also made it more complicated um, to figure out if, if you don't care where you go and you just want to get it, it can feel like you're you're really hunting for something. And, and that's unfortunate, but we're trying to make it as simple as we can. So if I don't have a cell phone or an email address, what would you advise as the best method for me to sign up to get a vaccine? You can call the main number here at the health department. And um, during the day, it's extension 243. On the weekends, it'll tell you a different option. We have different people that answer the phone on the weekends to do that for you. And then, like I mentioned, Drug Mart, you can walk in there. And um, Dr. Shu, I don't know, do you guys have a different option for the clinic? Is it my chart only? We're, we're my chart only, but there are over 15 private or uh, 15 pharmacies mm -hmm. at different locations in Medina County that are giving vaccines. Giant Eagle. Uh, Discount Drug Mart, Walgreens, Rite Aid, Marks, um, among them, uh, 15, over 15 sites here just in Medina County alone. So you could walk into any of those uh, sites and not have a cell phone and be signing up. Uh, and and uh, that would be a good way to do that. Another would be to have uh, someone um, act as your surrogate, like a friend or a family member, yeah, uh, sign yeah. up uh, and have you have them have you use their email address and then they could contact you if an invitation comes and make the connection that way. So we all help each other. I think uh, we'll be able to get some of these uh, underserved populations uh, some help to get to the vaccine that we need for everyone. Yeah. And do you know when you're signing up for a vaccine, can you select? I only want to receive the Moderna vaccine. I only want to receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. With the health department, you can, in Armavax, we very clearly say if it's a Johnson & Johnson clinic, a Pfizer clinic, or a Moderna clinic, and then you would just self-select a, a slot at a clinic with the vaccine that you prefer. Um, I know some of our pharmacy partners are only receiving one type so you really wouldn't be able to, to choose there. And I believe that they would indicate that to you and they would call you to schedule and you'd be able to accept or decline at that point. And at the Cleveland Clinic, we're getting whatever the state allots us. Uh, so um, we're either getting right now, currently either Moderna or the Pfizer product. And we don't have both uh, on site. We only have one or the other. So we, we're not able to offer choice here yet. And when people are signing up, they are not signing up for their appointment. They are signing up to get on the list for an appointment, correct? Correct. At the, so, 
Well, at the health department, you're if you if you call in on paper, you're signing up to be on a list. In Armorvax, you're signing up your yourself, and then you check. And when you pick a time slot, you're picking your own appointment that's when you great. use that app. So that's a little bit different than how our pharmacy partners are working that. And do you have to wait for the pharmacy to reach out to you to schedule an appointment or is there currently, is it on each pharmacy's website, you have to go through and look each day to see if there's openings? The pharmacies are all calling out. The pharmacies okay. are calling out and scheduling appointments when they have vaccine available and you come top on the list. I think that's why you might see and hear about people traveling out of county, several counties away to go to an appointment because maybe a, a giant eagle called them and they're going up to Sheffield Lake to get an appointment. That's where the, the next open slot was and they were the next person on the list. And if they accept that appointment, then that's where they're going. And so um, I think that you know, hearing that people are are having to go, well, it's not really it's selecting and being able to to go. But if you can't, then you would you would indicate when they call you that you need a local appointment. And I know I've heard on the news the stories about the pharmacies that are closing and their vaccines will expire. So is it a good time a good idea to just show up at the pharmacy at the end of the day and hope for the best? Or are they really hoping um, to make people wait until you're called? And are, are pharmacies in Medina County experiencing that? I've not heard of pharmacies in Medina County having that problem. I, um, at least at this point, when they call and make an appointment and, and they have a good show rate, people are going in because people want that vaccine. So, and they're calling very close to the appointment time. I think where you have places that run into a problem, if they are scheduling two and three weeks out, somebody says yes to an appointment, but then they get a call from somewhere else where they're on the list, they'll go to that and that earlier one, and then the later one will be an open slot. And so my, what I've heard from our pharmacy partners here is that they're scheduling very close to that appointment day and time. And I've not heard of any problems with that, with our providers. And with the Johnson, or not, I'm sorry, not the Johnson & Johnson, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, because those are two, both two-dose vaccines, there is a 21-day um, span between the two, correct? For Pfizer. Um, so is that being scheduled automatically, and will you get the second dose with that same provider, or will you have to reschedule that second dose? So I, I can start with that. With the health department, when you come in for your first dose, we schedule you for your second dose. So you leave with an appointment date and time for your second dose. And we've heard we've heard from calls coming into our call center, some issues with scheduling and having a second dose or, or what that plan was going to be from, from some pharmacies. The health department is going to run um, next week, a Moderna second dose clinic just for whoever got Moderna any other place. You can come to us and get your second dose um, because we do know that there were there were some just some scheduling and, and startup and some things like that with some other partners. Um, that's something that we're going to offer to folks. Um, but you should be getting your second dose at the same location where you get your first dose. Right. But, right, Dr. Shurvich, but we do recognize people are traveling. We've had folks from who get their first dose out of state and then they come here and they need their second dose or vice versa. So um, that's why we're trying to accommodate and help people because we want to make sure that people get that two dose series and are fully vaccinated. So that's something that the health department is able to do with some of our vaccine. And what happens if you don't that second dose in time, I guess, what is what is the next step? So you have the 21 days, but what happens on that 22nd day or the 24th day? Um, is it- I think there's some preliminary uh, data, not, not from the larger studies, but just some, some observational work that's been done that shows that you can go out to 
uh, several weeks beyond the, the deadline and still be able to generate that second immune response that will get you the protection from the vaccine. So I think we have a couple of weeks of leeway to work with if you can't get exactly the three or four week uh, window that's recommended by the manufacturer. So let's move on to once you actually receive the vaccine. So does getting the vaccine actually prevent you from getting COVID-19? Well, there's a difference between um, having the disease, which is in your body, or carrying it, it, it on your body, on your hands, or in your nasal passages. So the vaccine is extremely good at preventing the, the virus from getting into our body and generating disease, but it doesn't do anything about a virus particle that may have um, hit you in the nose or in the face area and is uh, there and could be spread to someone else. So that's why it's important for us, even if you've been vaccinated, if you're around unvaccinated individuals or in your in uh, crowded spaces outdoors or even uh, indoors, that we continue to mask and social distance and, and, and frequent hand washing to prevent that spread that could occur even though we've been vaccinated. So you answered the next question, which was, can you still spread the vaccine once you're vaccinated? Which is yes. <laughs> well, we do know that the people who've been vaccinated who might carry the, uh, might have some vaccine in their nasal passages have much, much lower viral counts than people who have the disease and who are uh, at bigger, they're, they're much greater risk of spreading the disease because there's much more, uh, number of virus particles in people who have the disease um, who, who are maybe out in public, unfortunately, like, a, like a, an asymptomatic person, uh, than people who've been vaccinated who may have picked up um, the carriage of the disease. So um, we don't think it's gonna be a huge spreading issue, uh, but it, it's, a it's a technical thing you should keep in mind and that's why we continue to mask and social distance. So why has the CDC not released recommendations for post-vaccination public behavior? I, I think your question may have come in maybe a couple days ago because the, the CDC- It may did, have. So probably, <laughs> yeah, it probably did because they did come out yesterday and um, they were very specific about you can gather indoors with other fully vaccinated people. You still really don't want to be in necessarily large groups, but indoors, no masks with you know, one other household would be okay. Um, and certainly there were changes. We made changes also with our, our quarantine and, and release from not needing to be in quarantine if you've been two weeks out from being fully vaccinated. So, so there are changes and I think those are, those are welcome and they're based, on, they're based on science and what we've seen and experienced certainly as the guidance that comes out to us from the CDC. So one, one viewer has written, so once you receive both injections, what does it really mean? Are you safe to go out and about when you're above the age of 70? How well protected are you? What is your best advice to give? Um, my parents feel that they will be totally safe after two weeks after their second dose. Is this true? What steps should they take? Um, they are not fully understanding the new way to life since they haven't been out and about in over a year. So is it true? Can, I mean, they've been vaccinated. It's been two weeks since their second vaccine. If they are around other vaccinated individuals, can they resume life as they had pre-COVID? Certainly in your home or in other people's home where you know that that's happened, that's gonna be um, pretty safe. But when you go out into public and you're in uh, situations where it could be crowded and there, you could be um, you know, in, uh, not able to maintain social distancing, it's going to be important to have your mask and uh, your hand sanitizer and be uh, wary of your need to social distance. So um, until we get to that uh, you know, 60 to 70% uh, immunization rate that's gonna chase the virus away for good, we hope, 
and, and respect. Um, those are the types of careful behaviors that we still need to do uh, to make sure we're doing the right things to continue to drive down cases. Is that the advice you're giving, Christo? It is, it is. I know people are so eager to, to get back to life you know, as it was in 2019. And we're like, you know what, we are going to, we will get there. But um, as just collectively together, we really need to take this in steps. And certainly that first step, like you say, Dr. Schubert, is that ability, you know, to really gather with other people who are all also of that same vaccination status, you know, moving forward, and then being cautious. Um, but um, it is certainly, it is, it's nice to be able to, to look to that horizon, isn't it? Yeah. So the next question is, how long are va the vaccines going to be effective? Will booster shots be required, um, like an annual flu vaccination? That's a great question. We don't know the answer to that yet. I think that we can reasonably expect a vigorous um, vaccine protection against disease that would probably be no less than six months, um, and maybe even quite longer than that. Um, but if we can get uh, enough people vaccinated in this short window that we have, um, we can get to that herd immunity level that will um, prevent us from getting into trouble when we go back inside this fall for next winter, which uh, caused our big surge this year. So we're gonna have, um, I think, if, if we don't get enough people vaccinated, then it can become what's called endemic, sort of like the flu travels around year in, year out. We're never able to chase that away. Um, although we haven't seen much of it this, this winter, that's for sure. Um, is that uh, you know, we may need booster in the, in, the, in, the, in the future if we're going to be still having low levels of that virus that we have to contend with and having flare ups in certain areas from time to time that may be something that we uh, may need to do, but there's no indication that we'll need that uh, at the present time if we continue to push for mass vaccination of uh, as many citizens as we can get. So as a follow-up on that, do we know, is there a time limit on how quickly we will need to get the population vaccinated to avoid having to get that booster shot in the future um, in order to reach that herd immunity more quickly? Well, I'd say the sooner the better. Is, uh, would you agree, Krista? I would agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we really want to certainly have it done by next fall uh, when we you know, when you get into trouble with people being indoors much, much more and uh, air circulating is not as good, uh, can't, can't leave the windows open, those types of things. If we don't have the disease uh, or the virus suppressed to very low levels in the population by that time, we're going to be dealing with uh, it bubbling up again. Yeah, yeah, we're you know we're concerned. We're gonna you know it's going to be a few weeks before we have the that Johnson and Johnson product, and we have a, a even more vaccine readily available. We just hope that 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 demand and desire and willingness continues in our population moving into the summer, particularly with our case rates going down, which is fabulous news. But I do worry a little bit that with numbers low, it might be off of people's minds when the weather becomes even nicer and, and uh, the thoughts are to summertime and not really thinking so much about the hard winter that we just came through. So the next question is talking about the side effects. So what are some common side effects of the vaccine? Um, and then the next one is, the question came in that they reported that it was a rare symptom of the vaccine or a side effect of the vaccine, but that they had heard that some people collapse after receiving the vaccine. Um, so if you could confirm or dispel that that is a side effect. Well, we have seen a um, fairly common set of side effects um, that occur at, at a fairly low uh, rate with the first dose of the vaccine, or maybe a little higher rate with the second. That has to do with uh, viral type symptoms of headache, maybe low grade fever, just not feeling 
uh, quite so good. Uh, I'm just feeling like you need to rest. Um, so that's, those are the fairly common reactions. Keep in mind that when you get the vaccine, you're, you're asked to remain in the area for 15 minutes afterwards. They give you a timer and uh, so that nurses can keep an eye on the situation. Uh, some people uh, collapse after giving blood or some people collapse after getting uh, their blood drawn just for a, a lab test. So um, I wouldn't say that that's a specific reaction that's common to this vaccine. Um, there have been extremely rare instances of anaphylaxis or allergic reaction to the vaccine, but not um, certainly hasn't been reported in any significant numbers, uh, either locally or nationally, since we've been doing this for the past three months. Have you had any uh, unusual reactions at your sites, Chris? No, but, but as you say, Dr. Shrewbridge, people do have different, different reactions to medical procedures. And, and we have, you know, with any vaccine, you, have, you can have someone get lightheaded or, or something like that and need to sit down, so. And would you say that for the most part, if you're going to have a side effect to the vaccine, that that is why you stay there for the 15 minutes that really other than the muscle soreness, the fatigue, after that 15 minutes, you're kind of in the clear for any severe reactions. Correct. Okay. Usually the, the side effects of the vaccine may not come until hours later or even the next day as that immune system reaction is generated. Now we had an individual say or ask, if I develop side effects from the vaccine, what would constitute needing to seek medical care? Um, at what point should I become concerned because this particular individual lives alone? Well, I would say that anything, uh, any situation where you feel like you're unable to care for yourself or feel incapacitated by any symptoms, you should get that checked out um, immediately. But we haven't seen uh, the, the side effects progress to that level uh, very often at all. So I think uh, this person who lives alone can be uh, relatively reassured that that's an extremely unlikely situation to have happen. But by all means, if something is going on that uh, is inexplicable or extremely severe, certainly would want to get that checked out. And can you, can you explain a little bit about we had a question about the adverse reaction department. Can, so can you explain what the adverse reaction department is for the people who may not be aware? And do they publish reports regularly? So the, there, is a, there is a system in the United States for, vac, for, um, for vaccine side effect, for uh, vaccine events. They do, I know the um, ACIP, which is the same group that reviews vaccine, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. I do know that VAERS, the group that collects information about vaccine events, I know that they do report to ACIP on a regular basis. I think the last time that they did, they gave an update, I wanna say um, the very beginning of January. So if you look for, I don't know the website off the top of my head, but if you, if you Google ACIP, um, they have all of their meeting, they have their meeting minutes, they have slide sets, anytime they meet. So like when they met to talk about the emergency use authorization for all three of these vaccines, all the information that was presented to that committee, it's all up on that website. I, I can look for that, Amy, and send you the link for that because people might be interested in that. Um, we also, we, oh, go ahead, Doctor. We, I'm sorry. We use the uh, CDC app at the Cleveland Clinic. It's an yeah. optional uh, program yeah. where you sign up through your cell phone and they send you an email or a text uh, every day asking if you've had any symptoms. It's super easy to do. You just click a few buttons and let them know how you're feeling. And it's a really good way uh, for them to follow large numbers of people and how they're reacting to the vaccine. So I'm sure we'll get some fantastic data out of that. Yeah, yeah that's what I was just gonna mention, that vSafe. Yes. Dot cdc .gov, and you can sign you can sign up there from your from your phone and they will send you that 
on a regular basis. And then if there's anything concerning, if they see something of concern, they, they do ask your permission when you sign up to say, is it okay for someone to call and check in on you or ask you additional questions about um, the side effects that you're experiencing? And that, that is some of the information that kind of helps inform the knowledge that we have about what's happening with vaccines. So we know that obviously these three vaccines are very new, but once vaccinated, is it possible that you can have long-term effects of the vaccine, like long-term reactions um, down the road from the vaccine other than being vaccinated? Well, not that we've seen so far. And the, uh, the, the studies that were done early on were mainly based on uh, looking at the safety uh, to making sure it was safe in large numbers of people of all different ages and, and races and certain socioeconomic status. So those early studies did not indicate anything long-term was happening. So that's pretty encouraging. Obviously that's not as uh, strong of evidence as getting 250 million people vaccinated and then seeing how things go. But uh, three months in, uh, I think uh, we have not been seeing uh, any large uh, potential side effect or long-term effect of getting the vaccine that's adverse anyway. Yeah, and even with side effects, what we're seeing is maybe a day, really a day and a half is really the, that outlier for side effects. And you mentioned the flu that the flu being kind of on the lower side this year. We yeah. aren't seeing as many cases. Um, and you know, from what I've heard is because we're masking and we're social distancing and you know, we we aren't going out a lot of places. So do you anticipate that this becoming an annual um an annual event where we mask and, you know, we take extra precautions during flu season, or do you anticipate returning to normal um, for future flu, flu seasons? How about a public health expert? You want to take a swing at that first? You know what? I was going to say, Dr. Shubridge, in some parts of the world, they do wear masks during flu it's common season. common in Japan. It's very common in Japan. Um, to do something like that. So, you know, I, as a way to, as a way to reduce our flu numbers, wow, wouldn't that be amazing if we, if we were limited to only a couple immunization or hospitalizations for flu next year, wouldn't that be something? Yeah. That's going to have to be a, uh, you know, a, a larger community discussion and uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure there will be opinions on, on either side, but yeah. I think we've all seen what can be done uh, to the flu with this approach. So it might be, I'm sure that um, some will take it on, on themselves to, to take that protection during flu season. Yeah. So I think it may be, it may be increasingly common in our, our society to see that on, on this side uh, of the ocean uh, yeah. compared to our um, Asian colleagues. Yeah, I, I very much think it would be a personal decision, but um, certainly one that we've obviously seen the value of from this season. Okay, we have a few more questions. Um, and these ones are specifically talking about children in the COVID vaccine. So um, we have talked about herd immunity a few times and according to the Census Bureau in 2019, about 22% of the population is under 18. So if we need about 70% of the population to receive the vaccine and 20% cannot receive it, how will we reach herd immunity? That sounds like a question on your public health test, doesn't it, Krista? <laughs> I know. I, I was going to say, it sounds like a final exam essay question or something. Um, well, I, I think, you know, if you're looking at just sheer total numbers, um, you're going to say, wow, we're never going to meet that percentage. But what you really need to think about is in different circumstances and situations. And so the situations where we know that 
we've seen spread our group gatherings, a lot of large places like that where we have um, spread and then and then spread from there out from there. So we are actually by getting our adults vaccinated, we will reach that um, within our communities. And what we've seen with children is that while they have been able, and we've seen the ability to spread. Um, they actually don't are, and this is this is probably something Dr. Schubert could speak to better. They're not um, very efficient in the way that they spread it. So some close family members or like a very close contact. But if you think of an adult and the ability of an adult to cough or to sneeze, that's a much further distance than a small child who's maybe five or six years old. Um, so I we will we will get herd immunity with our vaccination plan that we have for the U.S. I'm very confident in that. The thing that's been done here in Medina County, I think that's wonderful, is if you get the teachers vaccinated, then that tends to help uh, reduce the spread much more than if you could get all the kids vaccinated. Um, but we just don't have the safety data for the children yet uh, that, we, that we, we would need. We do have some guidance from our uh, uh, obstetrics and gynecology co colleagues, however, that it is safe and rec recommended for pregnant and breastfeeding women to go ahead and get the vaccine if they're uh, in, the, in the group that's uh, scheduled to get it. So that's that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. So do you know, um, I, the clinical trials for the AstraZeneca vaccine have started in the UK this month. Do you know if there are any clinical trials that are starting in the United States anytime soon for children with the COVID-19 vaccines. I believe I read something about Pfizer trying to start one um, in the near future, but that it hadn't been actually started yet. I'm not familiar with what's have been happening, but we'll be, I'm sure there'll be, the research will be uh, getting done in that, in that group. It's just, it, you have to be a lot more careful and uh, have very extremely well-designed studies to do that. It just takes a lot longer than what we've been able to accomplish with the grownups. So if I have, and this is my question, if I have a child who's unable to get the vaccine, but everyone in my household becomes vaccinated, should we worry about the child getting COVID or does my household essentially have herd immunity? So for instance, my child is 13 months old. He doesn't really go anywhere, but if my partner and I both receive the vaccine, does he essentially get that herd immunity from us then? Well, his immunity wouldn't come from you, but certainly within your household, you would have that, you would have that protection. And like I had said earlier about circumstances where we're bringing people together. So you have large numbers of vaccinated people, the vector isn't there to be able to spread efficiently. So, you know, from, from my perspective as public health, You've done everything that you can within your household with having adults that go out and interact with other adults in other settings. Um, but then certainly, I guess, you would look at where you take your child and who else your child interacts with and the families, vaccinated or unvaccinated, that you interact with. Right. If family members are not protecting themselves when they're out and around in, in public situations and in, in crowds and so forth, and then they come home and not having wear, worn a mask, then that's where the risk to be brought back into the household. Yeah. Okay. So we are almost out of time, but I want to ask two final questions. One is in the meantime, while we're waiting, just to recap, what should people be doing while they wait for the vaccine? I think they should continue to do the smart things that they've done all along to help protect themselves and their family members. Um, it's not fun, but it's definitely effective and is doing a great job to help us drive down cases to wear your mask uh, when, when you're out and about and need to, uh, and wash hands frequently and social distance when you're outside the house and uh, even inside the house if, the, if that's necessary. But um, keeping these, these smart, careful habits going is going to be crucial for us to get to the next stage in controlling this. What'd you say? I did a, absolutely. 
<laughs> Absolutely, Dr. Shubridge. Yeah, yeah. We have done we have done a really good job in suppressing the virus and getting us to the point that we're at. And and we're we're very close. Um, we just need to finish this push with vaccination. And and I can't tell you how much, you know, as a community, Medina has just really really come together. I know early on people were making masks, Dr. Shoebridge, and dropping yeah. them off at the clinic for you guys. And people have really taken to heart the need to protect one another. And I think that's what makes Medina County just such a special place to be. Yeah. yeah. Very proud of uh, uh, what's been happening in our, in our community. Yeah. So my last question for both of you is, for your organizations, where can people go to find out more about the vaccine with your organization um, or to sign up for the vaccine with your organization? What is the best way for them to contact you? You, Krista. For us, it's, if you go to medinahealth.org, there there's a frequently asked questions there's a video that you, that you can watch, uh, a training session that we did with the Office for Older Adults and the Wadsworth Senior Center um, that can kind of help if you're a little hesitant about using that technology, you can learn with other people and do that. Um, and certainly you can give us a call at the health department if you need help with either of those. So for the Cleveland Clinic at uh, clevelandclinic.org, um, there, as soon as you hit that webpage, the COVID-19 banner will pop up and you'll be able to be to get a MyChart account if you would like to. It takes uh, just a minute or two and you don't have to make an appointment or have a primary care doctor with us. We would love to have you on our list to vaccinate. Um, and we are not uh, discriminating against uh, or cherry picking patients to get the vaccine. So if you're, you have an account, you'll get on our list and and when the proper risk group is released uh, to get the vaccine, you could get it here. But we're not competing with other groups or pharmacies to give the vaccine. It's all paid for by the federal government. So we're just trying to do our part to get as many vaccinated as, uh, as we can in addition to everyone else. So we welcome any citizen to get their, their vaccine wherever they can. So. Yep. Great effort, and we're making good progress. Yeah. Thank you both for your wealth of knowledge that you're sharing with us. Thank you both for your dedication to the Medina community because it's appreciated. I can't imagine the countless hours that you have both put in, especially this last year. Um, so thank you, Dr. Shoebridge. Thank you, Ms. Wazowski, Absolutely. for your time this evening. Please remember to everyone watching that the Medina County District Library is open um, for regular services. We are also offering pickup blockers and curbside service for anyone who needs them. You can contact your local branch for those services if you need them. Um, this recording will be made available on the library's YouTube channel after the session is ending um, and then I will also email all participants who registered for the session a link to the recording as well as the FDA information as well as any links that Dr. Shoebridge or Ms. Wasowski share with me um, after today's session ends. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Take care.